good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I chose a picture for this slide which reminds us of where we are. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Schrodinger on the old thousand chilling note, which in the meantime has disappeared. No? <laughs> But, uh, I mean, if we think, w normally when one, think of the, one, one thinks of the founders of quantum mechanics, well, one is reminded of Copenhagen, Göttingen, perhaps Berlin a bit, but there was a lot going on in Vienna just 100 years ago. And uh, it's so good that we are here again. And I hope that this means that, again, there will be a lot going on in Vienna in the future regarding the foundations of quantum mechanics. So I think it was very, a very good initiative to choose Vienna two years ago. And I also like to say that from the little we have heard already, much progress is being done. In these two years, not only have we heard new things, but I think our ears are more open. And that is an important uh, contribution of these meetings, that we come to listen and then to talk. Of course, the first ones who spoke yesterday first had to talk and then they had to listen. But we had the privilege of first listening. So, and the next one, the next picture, ah, well, I should also say that uh, the work that I'm going to very, very quickly present has been done in collaboration with Luis de la Peña, who should be here, but he's uh, working very hard on, on a book that we have, we have a deadline, we have to, to deliver to Springer before the end of the year and with Andrea Valdez, who is a postdoc uh, researcher with us. And this picture, you may realize what it is. I took it last night. Huh? We were sitting there reading all the time this. No? Uh, can you read it? No? Yes. Causarum investigatio. And we heard from Anton Zeilinger, quantum mechanics has no cause. Well, usual quantum mechanics, what you, what you read in the textbooks, has no cause. But we know, and Gerard reminded us yesterday, and I'm sure at least most of you, if not all, who are in this room, believe it has a cause. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. For us, the cause, well, the, the, the cause of the stochasticity of quantum mechanics, because we know it is a stochastic theory, and Edward Nelson showed that long ago, and I think we have also done some work to prove what kind of stochastic phenomenon it is on a phenomenological level. But then we went further and we said, we don't have to look very far for that cause because we have the zero-point field. We know it exists. Well, in quantum mechanics, you call it vacuum fluctuations, but we, don't, we can think more realistically in terms of the zero-point field. And in fact, Nernst, also Einstein and Stern in 1913, but then they, they had some problem with a, with a factor of one half, and uh, they didn't pursue that line of research. But Nernst in 1916 was very clear about that. He said, this zero-point field should be responsible for atomic stability if we think that there is an interplay between the zero-point field and uh, fluctuations, no? And, and the tendency of the uh, particles to lose, their, of the electrons to lose their energy. And this is what has been pursued precisely by stochastic electrodynamics. Just 50 years ago this, this year, exactly 50 years ago, with the first work by Trevor Marshall, and there was uh, 20 years of success from 1963 to 1983, 
where many results were obtained that looked exactly like quantum results, but uh, on the basis of this Maxwellian zero point field, radiation field. Then there was a, a period of 10 years, which was very difficult, that's what I call the, the fall, no? when uh, the stability of the hydrogen atom could not be explained. Uh, the first serious nonlinear problem, force problem that was attempted to be resolved and uh, uh, the approach was no good uh, because it didn't really take into account the evolution of the dynamics of the system. The system is a very complex one. It is even the atom is a very complex system because it is embedded in this radiation field and you have to take into account that if you start at a certain time con connecting these, the, the field to, to the particle, then at the beginning there is a very complex dynamics, irreversible, of course. There is a lot of dissipation combined with fluctuations, no? and only eventually may uh, what we call the quantum regime get established. And that's already the non-dissipative, the conservative regime. But the beginning is not conservative at all. So there is a, an evolution in the dynamics that was not taken into account in those first studies between 1983-1993. But w when some of us realized that the approach had not been the correct one, we started changing things, revising them, and we think we have gone a long way in this direction. That, that's what I would like to talk to you, but in, in, in a few minutes it's impossible. So let me just tell you, I, you may have noticed that our abstract was the longest one of the, of the booklet. So it is impossible to condense that in uh, less than 30 minutes. But uh, we are about to deliver uh, the manuscript of, of a book that will contain all what I'm going to simply mention today. It will be called The Emerging Quantum, and uh, it will be published by Springer next year. So, and we start first by, um, by uh, looking at, at the radiation field in equilibrium with matter. Planck's problem, uh, but we make it a thermostatistical uh, study, as, as, as I will uh, show to you in, in the next slide, uh, taking into account the non-thermal fluctuations also, which normally are not taken into account because the, the, the thermodynamic treatment uh, considers thermal fluctuations, and there is, there is a, a, an important difference to get uh, to Planck's law. And, and that, I think, can in some way explain more deeply the meaning of, of, of this law. And then we look at the other side of the system, namely the, the matter, the, uh, typically an, an atom, an atomic electron. And we see how also quantum mechanics emerges as a consequence of this equilibrium between the zero-point field and matter. And we have two approaches. On one hand, a statistical approach that leads to from phase space to configuration space. And uh, one can see some of the quantum properties emerge in the form of, of Schrodinger equation. But then there is the other approach, Heisenberg's approach, uh, well, our approach to, that leads us to, to the Heisenberg description and which allows us to understand other aspects of the quantum problem. And uh, later, uh, I, I'll say a few things very briefly about how stochastic electrodynamics in this form not only contains quantum mechanics, but since the radiation field is there from the very beginning, we can also explain quantum electrodynamics, non-relativistic, of course, uh, on the same basis with no extra assumptions. And other typical quantum phenomena like spin, the electron spin, they are there. And non-locality 
one particle non-locality and many particle non-locality, and consequently also entanglement. Well, so this I, I will go through very, very quickly just to remind ourselves how, uh, let's say, the usual derivation of Planck's law starts. And it contains an assumption, of course, the, the assumption, the, the quantum assumption. We don't introduce that assumption. What we do is simply observe that this description that is on this slide refers to thermal fluctuations only. And it is uh, the, the very fact that there is a zero point energy is contradictory with this. There are also non thermal fluctuations that need to be considered. And the way to do it is, well, uh, looking at the, statistical, the, at the statistical distribution and get the, the total fluctuations that include also the non-thermal ones. And that leads us to a formula for the, internal en for the energy U in terms of uh, 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 DU and D beta the inverse of the temperature, which, when it is uh, integrated once, leads to the Planck formula. So there is no um, uh, assumption, a, a quantum assumption, but the Planck formula is obtained as a result of considering both thermal and non-thermal fluctuations in a consistent way. Now, uh, how does one get to the Schrenger description? Starting, our starting point is always a Hamiltonian theory. We have um, the dynamics of the particle controlled, let's say, by an external force plus the Lorentz force coming from the zero point radiation field, which is the E of T. And as you can see, it's a non relativistic approximation. It is approximate in this sense. Also in the sense that we are taking the dipole approximation because we are writing the electromagnetic field simply, well, the electric field simply as E of T. And uh, those approximations are enough to get quantum mechanics. So we don't have to make our lives more complicated than that. Which means that among other things, because of this, quantum mechanics will be an approximate theory. But it is an exact theory for all practical purposes. And there I would like to, to make this point because uh, Gerard told us yesterday that uh, quantum mechanics is an exact theory. Yes, it is an exact theory for all practical purposes. But in principle, it is not from this point of view. So we start with a um, um, statistical description, a statistical treatment in, in phase space. And then it's interesting to see that uh, the corresponding Fokker Planck type equation contains the classical terms, the Liouvillian, plus two terms that have to do with the radiation, namely the radiation reaction term, and the, uh, which is uh, uh, the one that is multiplied by tau. And the term on the right side, right hand side, which is the diffusive term that comes from the action of the zero point field. Now, as I said, um, at the beginning, the dynamics is very complex, and uh, both radiation terms uh, contribute uh, significantly to this dynamics. But after some time, and that's the assumption that we make. In those cases, let's say, where these forces, the interplay of these forces lead to a stable situation at the end, those terms then become radiative corrections. And we are left only with the classical terms. And in fact, the classical terms, which are left on the, on the left-hand side, they are um, already in the description in configuration space. They are expressed uh, by this operator M acting over rho. And those terms give an equation that has precisely the structure of the Schrodinger equation. It has the structure of the Schrodinger equation. But 
we don't know the value of this parameter eta. And it's precisely where the Planck constant should come in. So we have lost any trace of the, of, of the zero point field because we have neglected the radiation terms in, 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 the, in, in this um, radiationless approximation. That is when the system already achieve, uh, achieves a, a balance. No? But that means that we have lost also the Planck constant along the way. So how do we recover it? Well, precisely by taking into account that energy balance must hold. And that condition of energy balance is crucial. If this condition doesn't hold, then the Schrodinger equation has no sense either, because it would not be self-consistent, the whole treatment. So we need to, to calculate explicitly both terms of this energy balance condition. And that's what we do. But we calculate them already in the regime where this Schrodinger-like equation holds. And what we get is two terms that are very, very similar, but on the right-hand side, we have the, our unknown parameter eta. And that's where Planck's constant comes in, because it comes from the zero-point field. So that determines uniquely the value of eta. And it turns out to be h over 2, as it should. So we have Schrodinger's equation. And there is no other field and no other background noise that would give this result. So it has to be the, the zero-point field that, con that contributes to the stochasticity and leads to the Schrodinger equation, and with energy balance. It's not just because the zero-point field is proportional to h. It's also because it has the right spectrum, the omega cube spectrum. Any other noise with a different spectrum would not give an equality uh, coming from this um, energy balance condition. So it must be the zero point field proportional to H omega, omega cube. It's the only one that guarantees detailed balance. It not only guarantees detailed balance, it also uh, gives us other results that I will show later. But the other approach is the Heisenberg uh, approach, let's say, that the one that leads to the Heisenberg description. And there, what we do is again take the Abraham Lorentz equation, the same equation that we took as a starting point in, in the previous slides. But now we focus on the stationary solutions of this equation. Assuming there is more than one, we, we call them alpha, alpha equal one, two, et cetera. Those are the, the stationary solutions. We, we study them. The general solution of this equation is very complicated, but, and that's very important, if we introduce the ergodic condition, that is, that uh, in the quantum regime, the system satisfies ergodicity, then uh, the mathematics get very, very enormously simplified. And what we get then is that all uh, what we would call observables, all variables associated with observables, which I call here A, uh, capital A, become uh, functions of, of this sort as, as written there, but uh, which depend only linearly on the uh, external field, on the background field. This is shown here explicitly. You see we can rewrite the Abraham's Lorentz equation, but now in terms of the coefficients of the, of the Fourier expansion. You know? And you see that uh, the field variables, the stochastic field variables, have been left out because uh, the, the, the equation was linear in them. So we could divide, let's say, by the field amplitudes, and we are left only with the skeleton. You know? And the stochasticity has disappeared. Uh, we, we are left only with these uh, um, elements with two indices, which uh, uh, um, are, are the coefficients in the expression for x alpha and for, for any other dynamical variable. You know? So you see that all dynamical variables have become linear in A. And this is why we we can call 
quantum mechanics a linear response theory because the system is responding linearly to the background fields. And uh, the, the, response, the frequencies of the response are, uh, these relevant frequencies turn out to be the frequencies of the transitions, which should be no surprise that the system responds linearly to those fields, to those modes of the field that affect uh, or induce transitions. No. So, um, it, uh, matrix mechanics comes out as a, as a tool, as a very useful tool, because we have these uh, quantities with two indices which obey actually the matrix rules for multiplication. As a, uh, and everything as a result of the condition of ergodicity. So uh, it, it is a tool. It is not more than a tool, however. Uh, and where does the, the Planck constant come in in this case, since if we are doing the radiationless approximation? It comes from the commutator of X and P. Because if we calculate the commutator of X and P, it turns out that it has to be proportional to H, where H comes from the field again. So the field, the zero point field enters into the Heisenberg uh, description through the commutator. This is the, let's say, the size of the fluctuations. And in the radiationless approximation, we get the, the Heisenberg uh, equations. So, um, there are other consequences, as I said at the beginning, from the zero-point field, because the, the, the field is there from the beginning, so we can also obtain um, results from quantum electrodynamics in a non-relativist approximation. For instance, in, if instead of considering only the zero-point field, we consider also uh, um, an external background field, let's say a photonic field, you know, uh, expressed through this uh, G, this factor G, which is different from one, then what we get instead of dH over dT equals zero, which would be the balance equation, what do we get? We get dH over dT equal to these two contributions, no? Uh, I forgot to put a sum, no, over K, sorry. Uh, the first term, are the induced absorptions, that's what contributes to a rise of the energy. And the second term, which has two components, uh, are the spontaneous and the induced emissions. And uh, one can write them, one can express them in terms of the uh, Einstein A and B coefficients. And what one gets is the right formulas, not only for the B coefficient, which is also obtained in quantum mechanics, but of the, for the A coefficient, we can, which can only be obtained in quantum electrodynamics. Quantum mechanics doesn't give the right result for, for the A coefficient, for the um, spontaneous transitions. You know? so, and, and we get the right result because the zero point field was there from the beginning. Uh, another um, radiative correction that is uh, also uh, relatively easy to understand how it comes about is the lamp shift, because the atom is immersed, of course, in the, in the background, in, in the zero point field, and this contributes with an extra energy, which can be calculated uh, by simply taking our Fokker-Planck equation and multiplying it by X and P and integrating, and what we get is a sort of quantum virial theorem, which is a classical part, Ehrenfest equation, plus a radiative correction. And that radiative correction is a correction to the mean kinetic energy, like in the virial theorem, you know, and it comes from the field, and it gives precisely Beta's formula for, um, for the energy shift, with a clear meaning about about it. Where does it come from? It comes from the action of the zero point field. Uh, I don't know why. Ah. I guess, yes. And the spin of the electron, that's something also very interesting. 
it is there, but it is hidden. And it's easy, it's not so difficult to get it out from where it is, from its hiding place. Why? Well, think of the angular momentum of the radiation field. We know that there is a zero point component. In fact, in this expression for J, which is an expression for the, for the uh, electromagnetic field, well, it is a quantum expression, no? Uh, the last term represents precisely the um, uh, zero point or the vacuum fluctuations uh, angular momentum, no? the one half H. Normally, one considers a non-polarized field, and then the two components uh, cancel each other, and there seems to be no contribution from the zero-point field to the angular momentum of the radiation field. However, if one separates the two components of right polarization and left polarization, the spin is there because there is a one-half H associated with each one of the components. I've been talking about this, the radiation field. Now let's go over to the particle. What happens there? We know from experiment that electrons interact with, with circularly, circularly polarized components of the field. So let's take that seriously. That means that it's electrons are also interacting with circularly polarized modes of the zero-point field. And that means then that we should separate our ensemble, we are making a statistical description all the time, into those electrons that are interacting with the right polarized modes from those that are interacting with the left polarized modes. And if we do the mathematics, what comes out is very interesting because we have the two contributions. Again, if we sum over the two polarizations, they disappear. If we don't sum, we have them separately. And what we get is the one H half, uh, one half H bar for each one of the spin components. So there it is. Thank you. Yes, I am finishing. This is the last one, <laughs> except for the conclusions. <laughs> um, and not only that, but what we got, because we started with a formula for the angular momentum, the same way it is done with the radiation field. You know? We put L equal times, uh, X times cross P, you know? like the, it is done with the radiation field. And we, we separate into the components that are interacting separately with uh, fields of one polarization or the other. And what we get is an expression for the angular mom total angular momentum of just one of the subensembles. And there, what appears is the sum of L plus 2S. And that is very interesting because that means that when we write the Hamiltonian for that subensemble of electrons, interacting with an external magnetic field, what we get is this formula for the interaction energy, which has the right gyromagnetic factor for the electron, the G equal to, which is not something that quantum mechanics gives. One has to go to the Dirac equation to obtain the G equal to, you know, or to experiment but it doesn't, it's not given by quantum mechanics. So it is there, but it is hidden. It's just a matter of considering the polarization of the field and how the electron interacts with it. So this is um, an, an, another, another consequence, a further consequence of the zero point field. And finally, well, I will skip this one because this has to do with how quantum non-locality emerges as a result of the reduced description in the configuration space. Of course, the original theory and the system is local. And as, as also Gerard told us uh, yesterday, the ontology doesn't change of the system. If it is local, if it is causal from the beginning, 
then it remains like that. It's just our description that becomes hub causal because we lose trace of the zero point field and it becomes non-local for a similar reason. Because the mediator, the field that is, let's say, responsible for these apparent non-localities disappears from the picture. So, and uh, um, uh, uh, um, let's say a careful reasoning and with the mathematics done in terms of our fields, because we have the, the stochastic field expressed in terms of, of, of modes with random amplitudes, etc. If we do the job uh, carefully enough, what we get is that once we go to the um, matrix mechanics, we cannot express the states of, the, of a system composed of two equal particles in terms of separate states. But we get combinations of states that already show the entanglement. So the entanglement is also the entanglement between two or more particles uh, only if these particles um, share common modes of the field. Again, it is the background field that is the mediator between the particles and introduces an interaction where classically there is none. Uh, so I've, I've marked, I've highlighted with red our main conclusions. Uh, the others you can, you can read very quickly. The important thing is that the quantum phenomenon is not intrinsic either to the particle or to the field, no, but emerges from the interaction between the two. And it emerges as the system evolves from the initial moment when, let's say, both are connected, no, towards the non-dissipative regime that we know as quantum, the quantum regime. So these are, well, the conclusions from, from uh, what I've spoken today. And uh, what I would like to highlight still is that the dynamics of this transition from the classical, from the purely classical initial instant to the asymptotic, time asymptotic quantum regime is a very complex transition. At the beginning, for very short times, quantum mechanics doesn't hold. For instance, uh, Heisenberg uh, dispersion relations, they don't hold at the very beginning, no? because the system is, is getting stochastic, it's getting stochastic, and only at, uh, when the quantum regime is already there, at the onset of the quantum regime, you have, of course, that all quantum formulas are uh, satisfied, but not for very short times. And this is something that uh, still needs some more study. The, the precise, the detailed dynamics of this transition is something that still needs uh, some work because we start from a system that is completely outside equilibrium. And this is not an easy matter, as those of you know who work with, uh, with statistical mechanics outside equilibrium. And there are other very interesting problems that still need some more study. For instance, the extension to the entire field particle system, because we have studied the particle, let's say, in the approximation where we can think of the field as something that is rather passive, no? Uh, and there are other very interesting problems. We think that there is uh, still a lot to do. And there is a good future, however, for, the, for, the, um, for, for this approach and uh, new opportuni uh, much opportunity for new physics. Some of it, I think, very much related to what we have heard in other talks today. But we still need to reflect more on what these relationships are. 